Lewis Meads wrote a book called Mere Morality on uh, the uh, Ten Commandments, particularly uh, stressing the ethical dimensions of them for teaching and preaching. And he observed, it's a truism today that we're in a crisis of morals. The crisis is not simply that people are doing wrong things. That's been going on since the fall in Eden. The crisis is the loss of a shared understanding of what is right. Worse, it is a crisis of doubt as to whether there is even a right or wrong at all. I know that all of you in ministry, uh, preaching, leading the local church, dealing with church members who are dealing with some of the issues we're going to be dealing with for the next couple of days know this all too well. Uh, what is settled <laughs> is far less, it seems, than what is unsettled these days. Uh, by the way, I should have said uh, before I launched into this, uh, you have a number of notes that I provided. View those as resource materials. I'll make reference to them, but we won't be covering all the material in the notes. It's far more than we can cover in these sessions. And I will also make sure you have access to these PowerPoints, perhaps uh, at least uh, sometime after the seminar concludes. So I know when I'm uh, trying to concentrate and trying to write at the same time, sometimes it's difficult. Well, it might be interesting to know that uh, Smeads wrote this back in 1983. And so the obvious question is, uh, what has happened since 1983 when he was bemoaning all these years ago uh, we can't even agree on what's right or wrong anymore. We can't even agree if there is a right or wrong anymore. Well, I'm old enough to have realized, as many as you are, that uh, tremendous developments have happened since 83, 93, 2003. And it seems to me that those of us who are in ministry, uh, those of us who are seeking to serve the church, are dealing uh, in a climate where we believe, I hope strongly, in a very particular ethics, that the Bible teaches the right and wrong. And that we believe Jesus modeled that and taught that. And it has particular content about the possibility of right and wrong on particular issues. What is right or wrong? But we're doing ethics. We're doing ministry. We're preaching in a context that has in an increasing way, in my judgment, rejected these Christian assumptions, foundations, and um, Teaching. So how do we do ministry in that kind of context? How do we address uh, these uh, very important issues in that kind of climate? Well, again, what's happened in 1983? Whenever I've done any uh, surveys on what ethics topics interest you, this is always number one, and it's number one by a large measure. I include it in some ethics seminars I present in local congregations, and I always do so with great fear and trepidation. And to be quite frank, I don't know if I'm playing the chicken's way out or not, but I will usually advise uh, the church, I don't know that I would even advertise this topic, advertise all the others, euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, embryonic stem cell research, cloning, uh, abortion, on and on and on. It's okay to advertise those, but my fear is we advertise this one in the public uh, media. We're going to have demonstrations at the church door instead of having a, an ethics conference. I was delivering a series at the Robinson and Center a Church of Christ in Conway, Arkansas, and just across the corner is the headquarters of Gay Pride, Arkansas. And I thought, wow, talk about living in two worlds. The conversation we were having in the church building, the conversation that was taking a place uh, not 100 feet away. Well, in terms of the ethics question, bioethics question on this issue, of course it would be, uh, is there a gay gene? Is being homosexual causally linked or even correlatively linked to uh, your genetics? And uh, I'm sure you've heard various uh, responses to that particular question. Uh, it's been happening quickly. 2004, Massachusetts, the first state that legalized gay marriage. The next coming along in 2008. Uh, the next in 2009. And these are actual pictures off various uh, 
you know, signs carried in protest and so forth. And notice uh, the suggested new way of reading biblical text on this issue. The church sign had read, God says homosexuality is sin. And uh, the two pranksters had taken the S off. So now homosexuality is in. And that is being argued, as you know as well as I, at the textual level as well, where these biblical texts, which to me and I assume to many of us seem so clear, if we can't understand the text on these issues, I've always thought, how can I understand it on any ethical issue? And yet now those texts are being rewritten, reframed, reformed, and um, being suggested that they say otherwise than we've thought for years that they have. Uh, 2009, New Hampshire, again, I'm interested in some of the uh, hermeneutical and biblical questions that are raised in these signs. Jesus had two dads and he turned out just fine. And so this Christological, theological uh, argumentation that is being made, this one I think important, the sign that reads, as Jesus said about gay people and there's just a blank. Uh, if you deal with this question ever, you will be asked the question or the point will be made. Well, Jesus never condemns homosexuality. He never has a word to say about it or gay marriage or anything else uh, related to it. Uh, the question, of course, is are we prepared uh, to deal with those kinds of issues and those kinds of questions? Uh, our president has led the way, uh, coming out very clearly that he favors uh, gay marriage, and it seems once he made that public statement, the dominoes began to fall in rapid succession. So these states in 2013, uh, Illinois in 2014, and I assume uh, what is happening in Texas and other states you're from is the same as what's happening in Arkansas. 75% uh, of the voters of Arkansas had passed a Defense of Marriage Act a number of years ago. One federal judge with one signature just undid uh, what 75% of Arkansans had voted in several years ago. I think the same has happened in Texas, I believe. It just happened, I think, in uh, another state just today. Uh, along with this issue, the whole notion of what is family, and it is now possible with some of this biotech technology, uh, in vitro fertilization with uh, surrogacy, that it is now possible not only for gay couples to adopt children, but also to produce children which at least are uh, genetically linked to one of the partners in the gay uh, relationship. We're going to be focusing not so much on that issue uh, in the next uh, couple of days, but on this issue of beginning of life, which would encompass a number of questions. Abortion, it's been around, what, 41 years now, but it's not going away. And I know that you're wrestling with these in your churches and with your members. I did. And I have wrestled with members on elective abortions and therapeutic abortions and eugenic abortions. Whenever, if ever, can a Christian uh, do such? Uh, we're also uh, in an age, as the Time Magazine article suggests, we don't need husbands anymore. We can have uh, babies a new fashioned way. And uh, some of the bioethical issues, artificial insemination, particularly the question, is there an ethically significant difference whether uh, the genetic material for artificial insemination is from the spouses or whether it is donated by a donor and there are even donor banks that you can access online where you can buy sperm or egg to use in IVF procedures, um, surrogacy, uh, reproductive cloning, if it's not happened, I think it will happen in our lifetime in the United States. The whole hope and hype of stem cell research, my wife is afflicted with Parkinson's disease, so we have a great interest in the possibility of what about embryonic stem cell research and harvesting these almost miraculous, you know, totipotent stem cells, and they have the potential of becoming any other cell in the human body, and maybe we can inject them in her brain and they'll become dopamine producing uh, neural cells and her Parkinson's will be cured, praise God! Oh, we got to kill a bunch of embryos to do that. Oh, I see. So this is not without uh, some ethical questions as well. Uh, cloning, uh, I, well, I think it'll, uh, 
It has already happened in the U.S., but it has, it has not been allowed to carry on to the point of a baby being born. But I don't think that those boundaries will last uh, f certainly forever or maybe perhaps very much longer. Well, some of that seems science fiction. The problem is science fiction is the new reality. It's not science fiction any longer. There are folks in your congregations who are wrestling with IVF, who are wrestling with surrogacy, who are wrestling with these new amazing genetic technologies, genetic engineering, genetic screening. Should we? Is it okay if we do from a biblical perspective? Most of us are already wrestling with end of life issues. Uh, this will be Wednesday's topic. Physician assisted suicide is already legal in four states in the United States where if you lived in Oregon, Washington, Montana, and another, uh, you could at the end of life following certain protocols be given a prescription by your doctor that would be lethal. Now the doctor can't inject you with a lethal med, but he can write the script in these four states where physician assisted suicide is legal. And in the state of Oregon, the state in which it's been legal the longest, more than a thousand people have died at the hands of their own doctor, or at least at the hands of their doctor writing a prescription for a lethal med. Uh, Jack Kevorkian is uh, the name well known in all of this, not really a major player in terms of the philosophy and ethics of it, uh, but the name we all know, pushing, 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 not just physician-assisted suicide, but voluntarily active euthanasia, where the medical community would now be obligated not just to cure you or not just to care for you if they can't cure you, but would be obligated to kill you with a lethal injection if you so insisted. Um, they're not legal in the US yet, legal in some other foreign <laughs> countries, but the push toward it is serious. The whole question of enhancement of life, uh, when are we just improving ourselves, and when from a theological standpoint are we changing the very constitution of humanity that God set in creation? Are there bounds in creation in terms of who we are as imagers of God that we dare not cross? And if there are, what are those bounds? Uh, the technologies, again, they're mind-blowing. They seem like science fiction. Being able to engineer at the nano level, uh, information technology exploding, the cognitive sciences, all of this coming together in this perfect storm and then you add transhumanism philosophy, arguing we can make us better and bigger and faster and smarter. And we don't need to be content with the boundaries that uh, fence us in. We can have everything on earth that um, God promises his people. We can have eternal life. We can have existence without pain and sickness and suffering. And sometimes when I read the transhumanists, I'm thinking, I already have that as a Christian. It's called eternal life. It's called heaven. It's called being in the presence of God. Not there yet, but one day I will be. But they want it now, not through uh, the grace and the power of God, but through the power of technology. So the point of this series that I'm privileged and also very, very uh, feel very humble to be leading uh, are we prepared to deal with these issues? Are you as a preacher prepared uh, in Bible class, in sermons, to address them in some kind of biblically, theologically uh, responsible way? And how do we even get started? <laughs> because the problem is obvious uh, I, I, I preached for over 20 years full time before I started preaching, uh, teaching at Harding, and I still preach every week. Since 1979, there's only been half a year when I was not in a pulpit every Sunday. When I have a topic to address or a text to address, of course, I turn to the Bible. There's my text. Not so obvious for me as a preacher on these issues. Where is the book, chapter, and verse? Where is the text? And to learn a, a different way of getting at these issues, we either have to learn a different way or we have to ignore them. Because all, uh, if all we can do is, is 
preach out of a book, chapter, verse, text. It's just not there on hardly any of these issues. I don't know what your experiences in ministry are. These are mine and these are not all of them. Uh, I have had members in churches where I have preached who have experienced therapeutic abortions. Uh, The mother's either physical or emotional life is potentially harmed by carrying this pregnancy. The only way to save her life is an abortion. And they're in my church office saying, Phil, can I have a therapeutic abortion as a Christian? Or, Phil, I've just been told by the doctor that this fetus I'm carrying is very, very uh, badly malformed. And, uh, wow, I don't know if we can raise a child with those kinds of handicaps. Phil, am I required? You're my preacher. Am I required to continue this pregnancy knowing the baby I'm going to have is going to be severely handicapped and is going to cost hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of dollars over the course of his or her lifetime? Am I obligated to continue this pregnancy? And perhaps the saddest of all are the elective abortions when an, elder's, an elder confided in me, Phil, I want you to know it before you hear through the grapevine that my daughter's going to have an abortion. She wasn't married, didn't know she was pregnant. And uh, the given reason was she's in grad school, and if she has this baby, she'll have to drop out of grad school, and that'll just ruin her life. I was a 26-year-old preacher when I had that conversation with an elder. I, wow, I just respected him so much and still do. But I was so disappointed in that decision, even as a 26-year-old. I'd be more disappointed now. Surely there are other options when a pregnancy interferes with your grad school education. But I've had those conversations. Um, I've had more than one uh, family wrestling with infertility problems, a problem Liz and I identify with because we are one of those one out of 10 to 12 couples in America who are infertile, all three of our children, beautiful gifts of God through adoption. But we wrestled with all of the technology. What is it? Can we? Should we? Ought we? Will we? Uh, In vitro fertilization is what 99% of couples who are infertile choose to uh, opt for. Uh, Dimensions of it I don't find ethically problematical, but the way we do it in America to me is very troublesome. Hyperovulating the woman, so she releases a number of eggs during a given uh, cycle. We fertilize all of those eggs, maybe six or eight or even ten or twelve with some cycles. Uh, if there are genetic um, you know, problems that we might suspect, we might do some uh, you know, genetic screening. And we say we're screening for the disease, so we don't want this genetically linked disease. But we're not really screening for the disease. We're also screening for what? We're screening for defective embryos. And so uh, those are, we politely say, discarded. Uh, And even if it's not a screening for genetic disease kind of issue, we have all of these fertilized eggs. Uh, No fertility clinic, no doctor with any sanity would implant more than two or three, maybe four eggs at a time. You remember Octomom? They implanted 12 fertilized eggs in her. Eight took. She has eight babies. All right? Fire that guy, okay? I mean, typically you plant two or three fertilized eggs. The ethics question to me is, well, what do we do with the other six? Well, we put them in cold storage. Well, what happens to them? Well, sometimes they just stay there for 10 or 15 years. Every once in a while, they're adopted. Every once in a while, there are custody battles over them. Every once in a while, the couple gives us permission to do uh, genetic research on them. We disaggregate them. That is, we kill them you know, to do this research. Of course, the ethics question. I mean, you know this as well as I. What did we just kill? Did we just kill some human cells? Or did we kill something of ethical value? Well, uh, an end of life. My gracious, you've been there. Um, Phil, this is what the doctors have told us. Is it ethically, morally, biblically permissible for us to pull the plug on grandma? To discontinue life-sustaining Technology, I mean, it's the only thing keeping her alive right now. Uh, If we, they're advising us to pull the plug. If we do that, are we killing her? Uh, Or are we not? And can we do that? 
or the question I've been asked, are we obligated to do everything we possibly can, everything technology allows, to every last possible second of life? Translated, are we committed to a position of vitalism from a Christian pro-life stance? I mean, these are serious, serious, serious tough questions. Uh, I read a research on Reformed churches in South Africa and the conclusion was ministers in the active church ministry are increasingly involved in providing spiritual and moral guidance related to this new knowledge and technology. And it's coming to a church near you if it's not already come. So what are you going to do when they're in your office or when the question is raised in your Bible classes? And when there are tears being poured out and when couples are agonizing over these tough, 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 tough decisions. Are you just going to throw up your hands? You're just going to shrug your shoulders? Or without being pompous about it, without even beginning to imply you know all the answers because you don't, can you at least say, well, here's some biblical guidance that might be of assistance to you. Could we at least do that? The resources with which we have been blessed are wonderful. The Bible, of course, uh, I, I mean, it's my go-to resource when I have an ethics question. You know, I bathe it in study of scripture and prayer. But I am glad also there is this long tradition, this moral theological tradition in the church of which I am an heir. And I, I want to study that tradition and study those values and those principles and there is the need for moral formation in the Christian community. And God has blessed us with resources to, to share and to dialogue and to be accountable for one another. God has blessed the church with specialists, with good doctors, with good biologists, with good philosophers, with good ethicists, with good Old Testament, New Testament scholars who can engage in dialogue on these very, very serious issues. So the challenge to those of us who preach, and I got to tell you, I'm still a preacher at heart. I mean, you don't preach 20 plus full time years or preach now a total of going on 40 years. I'm still a preacher. I make my living teaching at Harding, but I'm still a preacher at heart. I'm trying to subdue my delivery right now because I get really excited when I preach. All right. How do you how do you preach on these? How do you even begin to address these issues? when there is no book, chapter, and verse? Where is the verse on embryonic stem cell research, on in vitro fertilization, on pre-implantation, genetic diagnosis, on cloning, on cybernetics, the you know, interface of humanity and machine? How about physical and cognitive enhancement? Could be something as simple as, hey, I know my kid doesn't have ADHD, but I heard Ritalin will really help him do well on his test at school. Can I use Ritalin off-label to wire up my kid so he makes an A on his biology test? There's folks in your churches wrestling with that right now. Where is even the book, chapter, and verse on abortion? If you can find it, will you please let me know? because I can't find it. We immediately want to say, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill. Uh, relevant, if you've already concluded the embryo is of the same moral standing that you and other innocent human beings are, but that is the ethics question that we'll talk about tomorrow morning. So the hermeneutical challenges are many on your resource documents. I give you several pages of notes that we won't go on, uh, go over now. We, don't simply, we simply don't have the time to do that. Let me say these are sources that I found helpful. When I commend them, I don't commend everything in them. But uh, Richard Hay's book, uh, The Moral Vision of the Ch New Testament, I think is uh, becoming a classic if it's not already recognized as one, has a very, very important section on how to use New Testament text in moral deliberation. Uh, Cosgrove's Appealing to Scripture and Moral Debate, uh, very technical, worth wading through if you're really motivated to do so. Uh, I personally don't uh, buy all of his principles, but again, a voice worth listening to. But the one I want to recommend most to you and that we'll spend the rest of our time on uh, is this work by Glenn Stassen and David Gushy, Kingdom of Ethics, a, a discussion, exegesis, application of Sermon on the Mount. And the dimension of this book that I found most helpful to me 
uh, in preaching and teaching in the local church. It's like, okay, I can get a handle on this. Folks in the pew can get a handle on this. Is this uh, procedure for making moral decisions uh, when there's not an obvious book, chapter, and verse? Uh, Stassen and Gashi admit they've borrowed it from others, maybe who borrowed it from others. But I personally found this, this approach very, very helpful. And, and I, think it's, I think it's graspable enough that folks in the pew can also wrap their minds and hearts and wills around this. So we're all making judgments at the particular judgment level on these issues. Will I have an abortion? What about embryonic stem cell research? Can I use Ritalin off-label? Can I, can I, can I, can I, can I? So we're making all of these judgments at a particular level. Undergirding those judgments are our moral rules and norms. And it's such a delight when there is a specific book, chapter, and verse on a given issue. There's my rule. There's my action guide. There's my guidance from God. I can put my finger on it. I can exegete this text. I can say, thus saith the Lord on this issue. The problem is, good luck with most of these issues, finding that text that's dealing with it at the rule level. So if we're going to preach and teach on these issues rather than simply shrugging our shoulders and saying, whatever, uh, letting culture have its way, we're going to have to learn to think and pray and agonize and teach and preach at the level, as Sasson and Gushi suggest, at the level of principle and worldview, at levels below concrete norms, action guides, uh, specific book, chapter, and verse text that aren't there on some of these issues. We're going to have to think and address these issues at the level of principle. What principles are relevant to this question? What worldview, what basic conviction questions? What about the nature of God? What about uh, the nature of humanity as God created us? What about creation theology? What is it in those resources that we can bring to bear on the specific questions that contemporary technology is thrusting upon us? That is, I think, the challenge of teaching and preaching on these particular issues. I give you two or three pages in the resource document, so I hope that's explanation enough on those because I'm gonna bypass some of this to make sure sure we don't wanna run out of time on the part that I assume will be of greater interest uh, to those of us who will be preaching the next Sunday. All right, so let's take this model with a little bit of detail I've been able to give you and with much more detail that's in your resource documents where uh, I go over you know, characteristics of particular judgments and rules and principles and worldview and so forth. So let's take two issues, adultery. Um, I suggest we still preach on that. It's been going on every church I've ever ministered in. In fact, sadly, two places I've been the preacher at, it was the minister who so carried on. Not the one preaching there then, but the one before him, okay? No, no, I wanted to make sure that was straight because my wife is here. It was not I who committed the adultery. It was the preacher before me in both cases who, among, for other reasons, got fired. And I was following that situation. So we're going to work up this sermon on adultery. Uh, When I was preaching at Sylvan Hills in North Little Rock, which is a 600-member church, I mean, I just always assumed it was going on (laughs) whenever I preached on it. Sometimes I would get up and preach, and, oh, man, I can't betray counseling. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There's at least three going on right now. Of course, I couldn't say that in the pulpit, you understand. But I knew when I was preaching it that adultery was happening in the church. All right, so it needs to be addressed, how we address that. Um, I've had to deal with abortion numerous, numerous, numerous times in local congregational settings. I could illustrate the rest of the night. One that really sticks out in my mind is the parent of one of our teenage girls in Virginia called me up and said, Phil, you need to talk with my daughter. Oh, is that right? Well, could you kind of give me a clue? Well, the clue is uh, she's uh, 16 years old and pregnant. Okay, and what is the nature of this conversation? How can I help? Now, she didn't just say it. 
But what she was saying was, I want to have your imprimatur as the spiritual leader of this church on the abortion she's already decided to have and that I'm encouraging her to have. Well, it's one of those rare times I was actually like, okay, I get what's going on here. I'm not usually smart enough to see that. And I say, Correct me if I'm wrong, but what I think you're wanting me to say is, and if you are, I can, this is the conversation I'm going to have. We're going to love you, and we're going to be by you, and we're going to support you, and we're not going to condemn you or judge you or uh, you know, pronounce the sentence of hell on you, though what you've, been, <laughs> what you've done is wrong, biblically wrong and regrettable, and I know you're as sad as we are about this, but we're still going to love you and support you, but please, 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 abortion is not the way out of this big problem you're in. And there might be other options that would honor God more. And I would explore those options with your daughter. Now, she wasn't so interested in the conversation now. Uh, don't let your folks do that to you. Don't let them manipulate you to just pat them on the back to the hard decisions they've already made that maybe aren't the right decisions. And we've probably all been there. Well, in this model of Stassen and Gushy, uh, so a particular judgment, do I have an abortion? Do I commit adultery? Uh, we can settle the adultery issue at the rule level. We've got the seventh command, thou shall not commit adultery. We've got a whole canon on sexual ethics and sexual purity and the beauty of lifelong uh, monogamous bonds in marriage. I mean, if you can't work up a sermon on that coming out of the text, God bless you, okay? I mean, you've got resources on that. But now on this other one, I can't find the text that addresses abortion at the rule level, that addresses it with thou shalt, thou shalt not kind of instruction. So on uh, Tuesday morning, we're going to explore, well, what are some of those principles that deal with abortion at the principal level and then at the world view level. Now, what I want us uh, to grasp, and that Stassen and Gushy, I think, do a good job arguing, uh, even if you have rule level, try to see beneath that. So, for example, uh, the rule, thou shalt not commit adultery. I know all of us would agree that God's moral commands are not arbitrary. It's not like he had some great celestial hat that had all possible human behaviors in it. And God said, well, the first 10 that I call out are going to be the commandments. Well, he just starts drawing them out. You know, there's this argument on the problem of evil. Well, God could have just as easily commanded us to torture, rape and kill. I don't think so. I don't believe God can command what's contrary to his nature. So these commands are consistent with who God is. And they're not arbitrary. And so even on my teaching on adultery, sometimes I want to go deeper with that. And the reason God forbids adultery is not because it's just some arbitrary command of God. It's not because he's wanting to rob you of your happiness. I mean, isn't that what you always get when someone comes to your church office and they're on the verge of an affair or they're already in it? Uh, oh, man. But doesn't God want me to be happy? To which I usually reply, I try to be very sympathetic. More than your happiness, he desires your faithfulness. And here's what I think being faithful means in this particular situation. And I don't think it means running around on your spouse. So quit it now, please. Um, but I hope the conversation doesn't stop there. Because uh, the command against adultery, I would argue, is driven by the principles of covenant keeping and truth telling. Why is adultery so devastating to people? I mean, it's like the sin that married people can't get over. I, I think we all understand why. Because it breaks covenant at such a deep existential level. I can't ever trust this guy again. I can't live with that woman if she would do that to me. That it's not just this physical act. It's what that physical act represents. That you lied to me. You betrayed the promises you promised to keep when we got married. I can't trust you. 
And without trust, you have no covenant. And then I would argue that it goes deeper than those principles and at the level of worldview that covenant keeping and truth telling are principles worth holding on to because God in his essence is a truth telling God. God in his essence is a God who makes promises and keeps them no matter what. That God is a God who in his essence will be faithful to covenant even when we don't do our part and we're not. So even when I preach on adultery, I want to preach beyond just quoting the command. I want to preach on these values and principles of truth telling and covenant keeping and honesty and making promises, keeping promises you make even when it's hard. Because when you do that, you are exhibiting the very glory of God in the virtues you hold and in the actions that you commit. That's what's. That's what faithfulness is about and what adultery is not about. It's not just a rule we keep or break. It's the kind of people we are, the kind of people who reflect the very nature of God. Now, tomorrow morning, I will do my best to work through the abortion question, the beginning of life questions on, all right, what are those principles? If there's not a book, chapter, and verse, what are those principles? Uh, I give you in your resource material uh, the seven-step decision-making model by Scott Ray in his book. Um, well, I can't remember the title of it. It's in the third edition, Scott Ray. I think it's, I think it's in the bibliography I give, I give to you. Um, and as I was working through this, I thought, you know, this is not a bad, bad model for sermon prep on these issues. First of all, gather the facts. Make sure you got them straight. I'll suggest tomorrow, for example, that a lot of sermons I've heard overinflate the stats on abortion. Uh, they're still bad, but they're better than they were 10 years ago, thank God. So gather the facts. What are the issues involved? I will suggest, for example, tomorrow on abortion, it, it really is a clash of two issues. Uh, the autonomy of the woman and the moral status of the human embryo, that's really the ethical clash. And how do you uh, weigh those? Uh, determine what principles have a bearing on the case. And I'll suggest all throughout these sessions, that's where most of your preaching is going to be. It's going to be at this, it's going to be at this step of uh, what are the principles that are relevant? I mean, there's not a direct command. So what, what principles, what values do I bring to bear? What are the alternatives? Uh, consider consequences, make a decision, and then, of course, bathe it in prayer. Well, I still personally buy this notion, and, you know, I've read the homiletical literature on the bridge is a good metaphor, the bridge is not a good metaphor, but I still think it's a pretty good metaphor. So every time I preach, I've got to cross this bridge from whatever world of the text I'm in, 8th century B.C. Israel or 1st century Greco-Roman world of Jesus, and I'm, I'm in some situated... <laughs> <laughs> place in the text, and now I've got, to, I've got to get from there to this audience I'm preaching to Sunday, four days from now, who don't speak that language, who don't have those customs and that culture, and uh, don't have those political issues or those social uh, constraints and on and on. You, you know, you're doing this work every week. God bless you. This is tough work. I wrestle with this every Sunday. I still do. Am I honoring the text? Am I meeting the needs of my people who are wrestling with serious, serious issues? Well, this I would suggest is a sermon on adultery. Oh, that's such an easy bridge to cross. All of us can cross that bridge. We've got book, chapter, verse. I mean, we've got command after command, verse after verse, model after model. I want to suggest that this is more like the bridge on uh, preaching on bioethical issues. This is the uh, bridge over the Bosphorus in Istanbul, Turkey, and we are actually connecting uh, Europe and Asia by this bridge to very different worlds. It's a very long, scary bridge if you've ever gone over it, which I have. And when I think of preaching on these issues, and you know, I teach this at Harding. I do seminars on this in local churches, but I'm gonna tell you, that's very different than preaching on it in the local church uh, in a 20 minute sermon, really different. 
And, and I feel like that's the bridge I'm trying to cross. Or sometimes, ah, I feel like this is the, doesn't that bridge scare you? That bridge scares me to death. Sometimes I, I think a sermon on abortion or embryonic stem cell research or in vitro fertilization might look like this bridge where if you fall off on either side, you're dead. And, and you're just trying to navigate, you know, biblical truth. Uh, and there's a precipice on each side. And uh, you're just scared to death. You're scared, am I preaching the truth? You're scared, is this going to be heard? And I don't know about you, I like my hermit sermons to be heard gladly, don't you? Is this going to be heard gladly? Probably not on some of these issues. I still have the courage to preach in. This is some of my sermons on bioethical issues right there. Uh, that's mine. Yeah, you've heard me preach, haven't you? Members have gotten to you already. So, you know, if, there, if, there, if, there's, um, if there's a little bit of haze in the preacher in the pulpit, there's going to be this fog out there. And Yeah, you've heard that. Well, I, I would suggest if you're at that point in your study, maybe you want to preach on the grace and love of God next week and hold this sermon off for a while, all right? But sometimes it feels like that. These sermons, I, I find them very challenging. They, they, they can be technical. I, I mean, all of us... You know, I was warned as a student, and now I, I warn my preaching students, all right, be careful of that Greek and Hebrew in your, in, your, uh, in your sermons. No one in the audience knows Greek or Hebrew, and you're just, you know. And, and you know, I've been told a million times, you're, you're preaching, you're teaching over my head. And I'm thinking, oh, these are really technical issues. And how do you deal with the technical dimensions that need to be deal, dealt with, but not in a way that just everyone's checking out? Well, I hope that hasn't happened here yet. So how do you do that? These are very complex issues. Uh, these are controversial. I don't know if you've had this experience, but members have told me, you shouldn't even preach on that because that's preaching politics. I preached a sermon on abortion on the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. I try to each year. And I have been told that a dozen times. Why are you preaching on that? That's not the stuff of church. That's not the stuff of sermons. You're, you're dealing with politics now. I said, are you going to tell me that the abortion issue is only a political issue? Are you going to tell me that? Is, is there nothing in the Bible relevant to this issue? Might it be a moral, biblical issue? No, it's just a political issue. You shouldn't be preaching on those. If you haven't had that conversation, I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Where are you preaching? I might resign Harding and go preach there, okay? <laughs> it's like, oh man, I, when I'm teaching at Harding or I'm doing this ethics conference in churches, uh, I always save homosexuality last because I've learned in my ethics classes, even at a Christian college, if they don't hate me yet, they will now. Listen, even even at Harding, I mean, as good a kids on the face of the planet from our churches. And I just, in today's climate, uh, uh, the next three-hour discussion will be on homosexuality and gay marriage. You know, we have these three-hour modular classes. And what happens? I mean, what, what do they start doing? <gasps> they start grimacing. They start poking each other. Okay. Well, or we could talk about the love and grace of God. What do you want to do? You know? Um... These, these are tough topics. So here's what I would suggest as we uh, wrap up. Uh, you know, there, there's no book, chapter, and verse. So we're going to need to learn to preach at the principle or worldview level. And I'll suggest ways to do that on beginning of life, end of life issues t uh, tomorrow and Wednesday. Uh, we're going to have to learn uh, how to do theology if we're not doing it yet. Because we're going to have to deal with these bigger issues of the nature of God, nature of humanity, uh, nature of human action, and so on and so forth. We may even be forced to do a little, uh, a little philosophy and maybe, maybe a little reading in biomedical science. Or this might even be better. This is probably better. And this is what I do even teaching at Harding. I'll call up my peers in biology and I say, hey... I'm uh, doing a module on embryonic stem cell research. Uh, I can handle the Bible, theology, ethics part. Uh, I am not so strong on the biological science part. Would you come co-teach that with me? And we have such a collegial relationship at Harding, they never turn me down. So twice this semester in my ethics class, I had a colleague from biology who came over and co-taught with me. 
I said, you know, Dr. Moore's going to handle the biology. I'm going to handle the Bible ethics. Um, and those conversations are really necessary. It seems to me in terms of content that the sermons are going to end up mainly topical, which uh, I don't want to offend anyone. I, I do not like preaching topical sermons. I mean, my favorite way to preach is just taking a book and go through Philippians, go through Genesis. It's how I love to preach. I don't think you can do that on these issues. So most of them are going to be topical sermons. I think you can do good systematic theology in the pulpit. The problem is what theological resources are we wrestling with on these issues? The movement, it seems to me, could be either inductive or deductive. I, don't, I, I, I can't imagine it has to be one or the other or anything required there. I think perhaps either. But here's the challenge. If you, you preach like where I preach, you've got to do all that. All the text, all the theology, all the philosophy, all the science. All, in 24 minutes. Right. So... Concluding suggestions. Uh, I'm really convinced if you, if you seriously um, you know, take the challenge on dealing with these issues in your local church, I really suggest you do some kind of Bible class sermon uh, combo. Uh, you need to do in Bible class uh, some of the tough, technical, complex things. And in my judgment, you need to save for your preaching. I'm just a big believer in a sermon having a single focus. You know, I just believe that strongly. And you take one principle on abortion, one principle on euthanasia, and you make it that sermon. Don't try to do 10. Don't try to do even three or four. Just focus on one. But I think it would work well if you're doing the tough part in Bible class and then you're doing the more uh, exhortative, principal part uh, in your sermon. Uh, I would also suggest that you can address these issues as illustrative of other principles or texts that, that are more direct. So, for example, you could be preaching a text about, uh, that relates to human autonomy, which to me is the, the critical ethical question on abortion. And the sermon could be on this text dealing with uh, human free will. Uh, is it unbridled? Is it unlimited? And of course, we believe it's not. Uh, does, is our, uh, are our free choices? Yes, those choices are free. But the free choices we make are not that, not they limited in, you know, in a good Christian person who's conforming in the image of Jesus by the kind of people we are and the kind of values we have. And I know I have the freedom to choose that, but I'm not going to. And so you could be doing a sermon on autonomy and use uh, abortion as an illustration of how this question on autonomy plays out really critical in a specific question. And then I would say, uh, you know, at, like we have marriage seminars, like we have parenting seminars, uh, there are some resources in our great fellowship uh, that you can bring to bear. And uh, you can have a special event uh, on uh, contemporary ethical issues or contemporary bioethical issues and bring in the experts, bring in the specialists, uh, utilize the resources you have in your churches, the doctors, the nurses, the teachers, the educators, uh, bring all of them together in conversation and just be very creative how you can use these, these expert resources in uh, dispensing very technical, complex, uh, theologically challenging material, but in a way that it, it, it gets there in the pew where it needs to be gotten. Because your people, I mean, your church, they're wrestling with these issues. I, I started to say whether you know it or not. You know they are. They're wrestling with these issues. May God help us to give them some resources in our preaching, teaching, and in other creative uh, programs that we might put together. God bless you. Looking forward tomorrow on Beginning of Life, Wednesday on End of Life. Thank you so much.